And uh, let's turn our attention now to the book of Proverbs. This, stu- uh, this summer, we're looking at God's wisdom for living uh, through this book of wisdom literature. Steve Hilkema kicked us off talking about how wisdom provides resilience uh, to life and living. Uh, that ability to spring back after uh, a blow, after an unforeseen circumstance, a difficulty that uh, happens in life in, uh, inexplicably and absolutely. Uh, Jonathan has uh, talked to us about how the fear uh, of the Lord is the beginning and the middle and the end of wisdom. And that our, the wisdom that comes from on high is what gives us roots for all of life. Today, I'm going to talk about the way or the path of wisdom, looking at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your flesh and a refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. This is God's word. So we're studying God's wisdom for living using the book of Proverbs this summer. Proverbs or wisdom sayings probably exist uh, in every unique culture. We have many Proverbs in our own culture. First things first, a stitch in time saves nine. Don't cry over spilt milk. Don't throw the baby out with the uh, bathwater. One of my favorites, hindsight is 2020. Uh, People who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Uh, Don't put all your eggs in one basket. We have lots of of Proverbs, and Proverbs are words that are skillfully crafted together to stick in our minds and to engage us in thought. Proverbs aren't necessarily promises, but rather generalizations of what commonly uh, uh, is known to be true and what is commonly true and applied properly and consistently is called wisdom. Wisdom is becoming competent with all of the realities of life. Wisdom is knowing how things really work, how they really are, and combining that knowledge and understanding with action. Now, wisdom is not just knowledge. Wisdom is not just pithy sayings. Wisdom is not just moral character. Those are components of wisdom. Now, I don't know who said this, but I read this quote, and it it supports this. The wise, the wise have knowledge. The wise have moral character. The wise also have character and heart to always do the right thing, even when the rules don't apply. Proverbs 3, 1 and 12 gives us three important points to ponder about wisdom. One, walking the path of wisdom, learning the process of wisdom. Secondly, and thirdly, knowing the person of wisdom. First of all, let's look and talk about walking the path of wisdom. The Bible describes life as a path. There's There's a path to life. Boring, repeated, Steady process of right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. You got to get up every morning. 
man, you got to shave and get your shirt on and get yourself presentable to go to work. I remember one of the uh, uh, classic uh, commercials growing up was, 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 was uh, uh, by Mr. Donut. And it was this old man waking up every day and his alarm was going off at three in the morning and he was hitting it and he's, his eyes are half closed and half open and he, he's shaving and he just keeps muttering to himself, got to make the donuts, got to make the donuts. Life is that journey of right foot, left foot. It's mundane, it's boring, it's consistent. It, it, it's not, life does not comprise of all dramatic events, whether they're positive or negative. So wisdom is applying certainly certain daily practices with patient consistency. Wisdom in the Bible is a pathway, not a door. There's no secret knowledge or certain experiences that give us instant wisdom. Wisdom does not happen quickly. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Abolition of Man, he says this, For the sages of old, the cardinal problem of man was, how do I conform my soul to reality? And the solution had been wisdom. However, for magic and science, the problem uh, had been, how do I conform my reality to the wishes of my soul? And the solution had been technique. Just go to our local Barnes & Noble over at Easton. It's filled with books on technique. Three ways, five steps, seven secrets, 12 easy seminars. That's wisdom as a doorway. People approach me and say, Pastor, what do I do? While that's a legitimate question, more often than not, the answer I have for them is not a silver bullet answer. It's an answer that involves a process. And while I wish for my life and yours that there was only one key to unlock the door to wisdom with my issues and with yours, I have found that the solutions have always been more right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, down the path of God's wisdom. Let's take our current cultural situation, a global a pandemic combined with heightened sensitivities towards racial justice with, uh, with peaceful protests and destructive riots. What's the answer? Well, I can tell you this. The answer is complex with many layers. There's no one easy answer. And why can I say that with surety? Because the question is complex with many layers. There isn't just one box to check to make it all better. There aren't eight boxes to check to solve the solution. It's not a quick fix. We all need wisdom, and wisdom is a pathway, which means we'll have to be patient. We'll have to consistently walk down this path. It's not going to go away quickly because the answers aren't easily given. I'm reminded of a person who had an issue that he really needed wisdom. He needed wisdom so badly, and he wanted a quick answer. And so he prayed to God, and he said, God, I need your wisdom. And I'm going to open up the Bible, and I'm going to find an answer for my situation. And I'm finally going to trust you. And, and, And so they closed their eyes, and he flipped open his Bible, and he pointed to a passage And he said, all right, whatever this passage said, this is wisdom on from high. I'm going to do it. And he opens his eyes and he looks at the passage and it said, Judas hanged himself. Well, he wasn't satisfied with that answer, was he? So he said, I'm going to do it again. So he closes his eyes and he flips the pages of his Bible and says, there's wisdom in this book. I'm going to do whatever God says. And he points it to his Bible and he opens his eye and it says, go and do likewise. Well, as you can see, these are not the answers that he's looking for. So he goes, I'm going to try it one more time, right? Three times uh, a charm. So he closes his eyes again. He closes his Bible. He opens it again, and he points it to a passage, and he's all resolved to follow God's wisdom from the Bible. And he opens his eyes, and he looks at it and says, whatever you do, do quickly. You see, 
we often want to come to the Bible for a quick fix. Even turn to some Proverbs, which are true. And they may be helpful in a quick response, but overall, wisdom is a pathway. Steady plodding, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. And after you take a journey and take that hike, you're able to look back and see, well, made some progress. But friends, please understand, there's no shortcuts to wisdom. It's not a doorway, it's a path. And for some of us, we even t t tend to turn morality into a technique, thinking that if I just do these good things, my life will run smoothly, God will bless me, and all will be well for me. And so you do those good things, and, and, and things do go well for you. So, well, in fact, you're able to write a, a how-to book, and, and it gets published. And then a tornado hits your house. The stock market crashes. You contract a, a disease. Your life is turned topsy-turvy. And now you need wisdom for when the rules don't apply. Now, fortunately, God extends to you and me a very gracious and generous offer. James chapter 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. There's a condition, but let him ask in faith, with no doubting. Wisdom is a path, not a door. And if we need it, we can ask God for it. But understand that it's going to come over a process of time, consistent applying of what God tells us to do is right. Second, we need to learn the process of wisdom. Have you ever been in the presence of somebody wise? I mean, you might even have nicknamed them Yoda because Yoda is so wise. And uh, they've been around the block. Why are they so wise? Where do they get all that, that, that inner calm and confidence and poise that, that is so attractive and that we want? Where do they get that? What were the practices of wisdom that, that gave them such confidence and poise? Well, I'm going to tell you it came in five ways. The first way, knowing God. We see that in verse 3. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck Write them on the tablet of your heart. That, that term, steadfast love and faithfulness, is the Hebrew word hesed. It means intimate, committed, covenantal relationship. It, it, it's not a, a, a middle school crush on somebody. It's not that kind of romance. It, it's a steadfast, committed love that uh, uh, will stick with you no matter what. And so knowing God is the process of wisdom. And not just casually believing that God loves me uh, as his child, but a deep tissue massage every day into my heart, believing that God loves me. And it's what we do is we put our heart's deepest trust in God and his grace. That's the beginning. That's part of fearing the Lord. It's trusting and believing in him and believing what he thinks about us and how much he loves us. And so every day we need to remind ourselves of his unconditioned, covenantal, committed love to us. Instead of putting our, our hope uh, in our idols or putting our hopes in our own performance, instead, what do we do? Trust the Lord with all of our heart, knowing that his love, his, his passion plus his commitment for us is greater than any other lover can have for us, and it's greater than any love we can have for another. Because I want to let you know, friends, God is smitten with his children. 
he brags on you all the time. He gives Jesus, he gives the Holy Spirit a nudge, and he says, look what they're doing. Now, in the South, we say, oh, even when somebody does something that's a little off color, a little off base, we'll add to the, uh, oh, God love them, right? Well, you know what? God says that all the time. <laughs> did you see what they did? Wasn't perfect. They stumbled, but I love them. He smiles when he thinks of you. My friends, the scripture says, the process of wisdom says, bind those truths around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Never, ever, ever forget them or try to live apart from those truths. That's the first process of wisdom. Know God and know how much he loves you. The second part is knowing yourself. Look at verses, uh, we'll see that in verses five and seven. I'll, I'll, I'll get to those in a bit. Here's, here's the great paradox of wisdom. Wise people are aware of their foolishness. Wise people know their blind spots and their character flaws and their limitations. One of the Proverbs says this, if you say you're not a fool, you're a fool. So knowing self or an accurate self-awareness is a very important step in the process of becoming wise. Do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 7, be not wise in your own eyes. For years, I have uh, conducted assessments for uh, potential uh, candidates for their fitness of church planting. Most of them are all already pastors, and uh, it takes us a, a, a unique person to be a church planter. Um, and so in the process of, of assessing uh, their calling and their character and their uh, competencies, we have them do a 360 uh, review of themselves. Uh, we call it the, the CLI, the church leader inventory. The spouse takes it, the church leader spouse inventory as well. Uh, they take the test the survey, and they also have five to seven references uh, take that exam as well. The first thing I look for when I get their results is self-awareness. Do the average scores of the person's references match their scores? Because that tell, if they do, if they line up, that says that person has a good self-aware perspective of themselves because that's what others are saying about them. You know, I just recently did this myself. I took it, and I've taken tons of these instruments. I came across one that I had to take uh, that was different. It's called the Flippin' Profile. Uh, I asked seven other people uh, to take that reference. So when the scores came back, what's the first thing I checked? Am I self-aware or am I off base? Well, it wasn't perfect, but I was largely on track. I'll let you know. But here's what we need, friends. We need ruthless but non-traumatic self-examination to help us know ourselves better, which puts us on the path to wisdom. Calvin, John Calvin, he actually neatly summarizes our first two points of knowing God and knowing self. He says this, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. But while joined by many bonds, which one proceeds and brings forth the other is not easily to discern. Knowing God, knowing ourselves. What else is this process of wisdom? Knowing your friends. Look at verse 1 and even later in 12. What does it say? My son. This is one person talking to another. Person with authority. A father figure talking to their son. And sharing wisdom. Imparting truth. And this tells us something. This gives us a really big clue. And that is this, that we'll never find wisdom by ourselves. You'll never find wisdom solely on your own. We need mentors. We need counselors. We need to, to live in community. It's one of the reasons that we do small groups at Walnut Creek. We don't have just seminars and we don't want gurus. 
because you can acquire knowledge in a class, but wisdom comes in community. People, friends who point us to God, who know us all the way down to the bottom and who can help us right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, down life's path. The fool, the Proverbs tell us, is individualistic. I can do it all on my own. Well, I have to make a confession. This is where you women have a leg up on us men. You see, we men tend to believe that the more independent and individualistic we become, the more mature and wise we are. Ah, uh, but you ladies, you're a lot smarter than us. You lead, ladies tend to think that the more interdependent I am on others, the more mature and wise I am. And you gals are correct. Wise people can stand on their own two feet, but they choose to seek the counsel of others and are willingly held accountable. They surround themselves with allies and confidants in order to help them down life's pathway and wisdom's pathway. Knowing God, knowing ourselves, knowing our friends, knowing God's best practices. Just briefly in verses 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be full and your vats plenty. You see, verses 9 and 10 come from the Torah, the commandments and laws that God laid out for his people. Think of it uh, in a sense this way. Scripture is God's database of best practices. Now, I know that you've heard us say repeatedly and over and over here at Walnut Creek that Scripture is the history of God's redemption. And that's true of God's rescuing uh, humanity, uh, and it is. But we can also read Scripture as God's best practices. And knowing God's best practices, walking the path of wisdom will lead to beneficial things. Verse 1, long life and prosperity. Verse 4, people will like you. Verse 8, health. Verses 9 and 10, wealth. Knowing God, knowing yourself, knowing your friends, knowing God's best practices. And finally, the process of wisdom is knowing trouble. I mean, bad things happen as we journey down life's path. Life is not always smooth and successful. There are bumps, there's washouts, there's falls, there's dead ends, there's suffering on the path of life. And wisdom does not avoid suffering, but transforms suffering into more wisdom. So in the midst of suffering, my friends, I'm going to encourage you, stay on the path. Don't become stoic bitter, cynical. Don't quit. Those are counterproductive responses to wisdom. Actually, they're, they're, they're foolish, immature responses. If you, if you want to turn life's lemons into lemonade, then understand that suffering is the fast track to more wisdom. Accept and learn from difficulties and suffering. And through the gospel, through the lens knowing that God loves you and allows these difficult things to happen in your life, recognize them not as a punishment, but as a way of refining you. Wisdom is a path. There's a process to wisdom. And lastly, let's talk about knowing the person of wisdom. The New Testament tells us that the personified divine wisdom of the Old Testament is actually Jesus himself. Jesus showed the ultimate trust and faithfulness to God and to us by going to the cross. He didn't lean on his own understanding. Instead, he was saturated and shaped by the scripture. He was meek. He was lowly in heart. And he, though rich, became poor for us. And, and Jesus bore his suffering for us without complaint. So friends, we, we, we can only grow in wisdom from on high 
if we know that we have been saved by costly grace. That keeps us from idols. That keeps us from self-sufficiency and pride and and from selfishness with, with our things and from crumbling under criticism and troubles. Jesus himself is wisdom personified and believing the gospel brings these character qualities of Jesus into our lives. But here's the catch. There's some fine print involved. I'm going to have to let you know. The wisdom of the person of Jesus and believing his message of forgiveness and grace that comes from the cross is considered foolishness to our world. Paul in 1 Corinthians says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but those to whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. The Apostle Paul is telling us this. What the world considers wise is actually folly in God's economy. And what God calls wise and necessary and healthy is disagreeable and distasteful to our culture. For example, our culture says this, second place is really first loser. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Get ahead. That's the message of our culture. What is the message that Jesus gives us? The first will become last And the last will be first. If you want to be somebody, be a nobody. If you wish to sit at the high table, go sit at the kids' table and be invited to come up. That's the message that Jesus gives us. And it's completely different than the message the world gives us. Our culture says things like, make your own destiny. Whatever the mind uh, can conceive, you by willpower can achieve. Autonomous, self-law, hey, zones, hey, those are cool. But Jesus says this, in my death and resurrection lies your eternal destiny and identity. Take up your cross daily and follow me, not your own desires, not your own laws. Not your own witches, but follow me. My friends, this, this right foot, left foot, this process of a pathway and process of wisdom, knowing the person of, Je- uh, of, of wisdom through Jesus, I need to let you know is costly. Wisdom costs you something. I mean, people and companies and businesses are willing to pay wise consultants tons of money for their consultation, for their wisdom. And you need to know that the person of wisdom, Jesus himself, is costly too. He's costly because first, he paid the ultimate price to be the wisdom for you. And then as a response, knowing that Jesus has given so much for us, he says, give the same to me. Give your life to me. Turn over the steering wheel down your road to me and trust me. But I'll let you know this, that when you do that, that knowing Jesus will give you such poise and confidence. It's going to give you such freedom and, 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 um, and joy that the world will actually marvel at you even though you're believing something they consider as foolish, they will actually marvel, marvel at that. Why do I know that's true? Because um, uh, in Acts chapter 4, and we had just concluded recently a study in the book of Acts. 
But listen to what Acts 4.13 says. Now when they, the wise men of Israel, the wise old sages of Israel, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that the disciples were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they had recognized that they had been with Jesus. What astounded the wise sages of Israel? That these common, uneducated, blue-collar fishermen had been with Jesus, and hence they had become wise. Wisdom is a pathway, not a door. So let's walk that path with Jesus alongside us. He's wisdom personified, and he's willing to share all of his life and all of his wisdom with us to help us navigate the path before us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we read, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. And we're asking for wisdom. But one of the reasons that we are lacking wisdom is we don't know you. We've been leaning on our own understanding. We have not been trusting you. And so in order to ask you for wisdom, we need to ask you for you. And so our confession is this, Lord, I need you. Because when I have you, I will start to have wisdom. I will start to know how to navigate through life. I will know how to be kind and compassionate and empathetic towards others. I will know how to have poise and confidence when, when life and situations buffet and assail me. So yes, we're asking for wisdom, but not for wisdom's sake. We're asking for more of you. So Jesus, please be real to us. Let us know each and every one of us this week in some inexplicable manner that you love us more than we could ever conceive. And may we believe that. And as we do so, Lord, we will claim this promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. So walk with us down this path we are. Put on through your sovereignty and may we become more and more wise as we walk alongside you. For it's in our beautiful Savior's name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we confess our faith, we express our trust in what will help us walk the path of wisdom. We give ourselves to the truth that God has revealed to us. And so let's affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen.